Good evening. Good evening, all, and welcome to our second lecture in our resource fair lecture series. Uh, we have this resource fair every October and try to have a lecture every Tuesday of that month. Um, we're the Chad chapter from Northern Virginia and DC. My name is Dr. Terry Bullis, and I'm one of the board members of Chad. And with us tonight, we have Dr. Karen Barblow. She's the other person that you see on your screen. In a moment, I'm going to put a few slides up here. But first, I just wanted to say that tonight, um, we're just so pleased to have Dr. Barblow. I feel like we've been asking you a few times over the last few years, Dr. Barblow, to join us. And we're really excited to have you here with us tonight. Um, in our chapter, Chad of Northern Virginia and DC. We're one of just many chapters with Chad National. And as such, our mission aligns with the national mission of improving the lives of those affected with ADHD. We are a volunteer organization of trained professionals who offer support in a number of ways. So in addition to offering this free uh, lecture series for the resource fair, during the course of the year, we usually offer one every Tuesday of the month of the um, I think it's the third Tuesday of every month. Um, we also have support groups for parents, students, and adults, um, and do our best to highlight ADHD awareness during this month of October, which is ADHD Awareness Month. So now I'd like to share um, our sponsors for the 2022 Resource Fair, which um, has included a live exhibit fair that happened last um, weekend, as well as all of the lectures that we have going on this month. So I'm going to share my screen and I might have to start my presentation um, accordingly. Here we go. There, and we'll fix this. And hopefully everybody can see that. These are our wonderful sponsors for this year. Um, Bass Educational Services is one of our gold sponsors. They are a full service educational consulting group dedicated to the premise that learning differently should not be a barrier to academic success. Services include K-12 school placement, ACT and SAT test prep, subject tutoring, ADHD and EF coaching, educational advising, as well as college post-secondary and gap year planning. Their consultants are also available for workshops and speaking events. The Chesapeake Center has dedicated 35 plus years to treating those with ADHD, learning differences, and their many coexisting conditions across the lifespan. Their mission is to help people with ADHD, sorry, attention or ADHD, um, learning and behavioral challenges, learn how to lead successful, satisfying lives. They offer comprehensive treatment with individualized care. And finally, our last gold sponsor is the Ross Center. They've been delivering a full spectrum of sophisticated psychiatric and psychological services that result in meaningful change for individuals and families for over 30 years. They offer comprehensive ADHD testing for children and adults, as well as therapeutic and psychiatric services to minimize symptoms and improve behavior and self-control. Our silver sponsors um, include the following. Here we go. Oh, hang on just one moment. I feel like I am missing. There we go. All right. Illuminos Academic Coaching and Tutoring is an industry leading academic coaching and tutoring organization offering in-person support to students in third grade through college in and around the entire DMV area, as well as virtually throughout most of the world. Integrated Psychology Associates of McLean offer comprehensive services to meet the psychiatric assessment and therapy needs of a diverse community. They offer child and adolescent therapy, group therapy, adult therapy, family therapy, couples, and marital therapy. Learning RX is a one on one brain training center that uses 35 years of research, development, and experience delivering their cognitive training programs throughout the world. They help clients with reading struggles, attention struggles, weak memory or memory decline, slow processing, learning disabilities, brain injuries, and more. And finally, the last two silver sponsors. Pathfinder Coaching and Tutoring's founder, Pat Hudak, provides virtual coaching to families affected by ADHD and executive function challenges. With an emphasis on positive reinforcement, their coaches and tutors cover topics such as goal setting, organizing, prioritizing tasks, note-taking, learning material, problem-solving, communicating effectively, managing impressions, and self-advocating. 
And the Siena School, a national leader in dyslexia education, serves bright college-bound students with language-based learning differences. Students receive personalized instruction in small classes with highly trained, experienced teachers. Its multi-sensory curriculum integrates technology seamlessly and enables students to explore their strengths and creativity. So tonight, Dr. Barblow is here to join us and talk a little bit about understanding your options, diagnosis and treatment for ADHD. It's a very hot topic. I'll tell you a little bit about Dr. Barblow. She is a pediatrician with a practice dedicated to the comprehensive treatment of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and related conditions. Prior to becoming a physician, she worked for several years in the fields of education, social work, and counseling, and she draws from each of these fields in her private practice. Dr. Barblo is also open about the fact that she gains insight from her personal experiences as an individual with ADHD. Dr. Barblo's undergraduate studies were completed at Duke University in 1989, and she then studied social work at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She graduated from the George Washington University School of Medicine in 1998, where she was a National Health Service Corps Scholar. She completed her pediatrics residency at Innova Fairfax Hospital for Children, then an affiliate of the University of Virginia. Passionate about ADHD and behavioral pediatrics, Dr. Barbara has a treatment style which addresses the unique needs of her patients and their family members. She is invested in working with families to improve their overall function, in addition to supporting the progress of her individual patient. As a resident of the DC metropolitan area for over 25 years, she is familiar with an array of available services, and she incorporates as many modalities of treatment as will be effective. And with that, we welcome you, Dr. Varblo. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Terry Bullis, uh, for that warm introduction. I appreciate it. Um, I want to make sure, is my screen sharing correctly? And Okay, we're good to I go. I believe so. I can see it. All right. Um, so, as Terry has said, I am Dr. Karen Barblow, um, and I'm really excited to be here tonight. I have been, we've been working together for years, trying to figure out a way to coordinate um, a time when I could um, to come and present with you all, and I'm really pleased that it's finally happened tonight. Okay, we're gonna talk about um, really three things tonight. Understanding your options for diagnosis and treatment of ADHD. We're gonna talk about how somebody gets diagnosed with ADHD, how somebody get, can get treated for ADHD, and within those options, when we talk about medication, who would be an appropriate provider to manage medication? Um, so those are the three um, sort of sections of the talk. As I go through, if y'all have questions, please feel free to write them in the chat and I'll pause periodically. Um, and do you go by Terry or Dr. Bullis? I don't know. Um, oh, Terry's fine. Okay. Um, and Terry will um, will help um, you know navigate which of those uh, questions in the chat we'll, we'll address as we go through. Okay. All right. First of all, before we get too far into diagnosing ADHD, I wanna spend just a couple of minutes on the definition. Um, this is something that I'm sure you're all probably familiar with. I wanna highlight that when I talk about the definition of ADHD, I talk about specifically thinking about how, we're, how people um, cope with the requirement that they do non-preferred tasks. So, what I like to say is, you know, when we're talking about preferred tasks, when we're talking about doing things that we love to do, essentially there is no ADHD. There's certainly no kind of impairment. The impairment comes in when we're talking about doing things that we just don't want to do. We want to have done them maybe, or somebody else wants us to have done them um, or to do them, but they are really not the things that we are interested in, in spending our time on and our energy on and so forth. So as we go through the criteria, keep that in mind because it can really be confusing if you don't keep that in mind. Um, the criteria can be um, going through and, and answering questions about whether your child displays X, Y, or Z sort of symptom of ADHD can be difficult to, to say unless you're thinking really specifically about non-preferred tasks. So, there are three different presentations of ADHD. There's primarily in inattentive, 
primarily hyperactive impulsive and the combination. Um, the inattentive symptoms include things such as failure to pay, pay close attention to details, trouble maintaining attention, not appearing to listen when you're spoken to directly, not following through, avoiding tasks or, or reluctantly doing tasks that require sustained mental effort, you know, organization, getting distracted, being forgetful, things like this. The hyperactive impulsive symptoms include things like fidgeting or squirming in your seat, um, un being unable to sit still even when, or especially when it's expected, um, running or climbing if you're a small person, if you're an adolescent or adult, this may just sort of feel like restlessness. You might kind of feel like running or climbing mentally, <laughs> even if you're not actually physically doing that. Um, these are the, the people with the hyperactive impulsive symptoms are the people that are described as sort of um, on, on a, you know, running on a motor. Um, their motor is just revving constantly, constantly, constantly. They're just go, go, go. These are the energizer bunnies. They're, they have trouble waiting their turns. They intrude, they talk excessively and so forth. And then as the name implies, the combination would be um, the, the inattentive symptoms as well as the hyperactive impulsive symptoms. There are some other um, sort of qualifiers to meeting the criteria and actually receiving a diagnosis of ADHD, but these are kind of the, the, the basics of the different um, presentations. If you want more information about how to get a child evaluated for ADHD, I refer you to, to chad.org's um, page, which I've outlined for you here. Evaluations can begin at age four, officially. Unofficially, we can certainly um, have some inklings and some suspicions, but officially we can do a, um, evaluations at age four. And there are three kinds of professionals who can evaluate for and diagnose ADHD in children. The first is healthcare providers. The second is psychologists. Typically that happens through a process of um, educational or psychoeducational or psychological testing. And the third is qualified school personnel. And this is really in the context of, does the child qualify for accommodations in the school setting? And so it may not have the same broad implications um, as a diagnosis made by one of these other two kinds of professionals would have. Um, okay, so even before I go on to how um, to to the next section, any questions about how ADHD is diagnosed? I would say that um, the the basically what I recommend and what tends to happen a lot of the time is people will start with their primary care provider. This is generally speaking going to be either a pediatrician or a family practitioner. Because in the past, ADHD was really only essentially viewed as a childhood disorder, people who, doctors who were trained in internal medicine, so the primary care folks for adults were really not trained in ADHD much at all and tend, as a, as a generalization, tend not to feel very comfortable treating it. So even if you are an adult, if you want to get diagnosed and or treated by a primary care physician, I usually recommend that you look into family practitioner because the family practice docs were trained in childhood disorders as well as in adult disorders. And you might find that they're more um, comfortable with, with this disorder. Um, and so if we start with primary care, then generally speaking, we're looking at um, an observation of the child we're looking at interviews of the parents, sometimes interviews of other adults who interact with the, with the child, and we're looking at history. And that those components can form the basis of a diagnosis. A, a, a healthcare provider might refer you or your child on to a psychologist if it's unclear not only whether or not the person, the child has ADHD, but also 
even, you know, the ADHD might explain sort of the, the symptoms and some of the behaviors that we see, which are in the, the um, previous slides, but other things can do that also, you know, learning disabilities, um, autism, slow processing speed, anxiety, depression, all different kinds of things. And so if the healthcare provider feels like it's, it could very well be ADHD, but I really want to check out some of these other possibilities before we make a, de a definitive diagnosis, that might be a, a time that they would refer you to a psychologist for more uh, in-depth testing that can help separate out some of these um, kind of other conditions that can mimic or um, overshadow ADHD. Um, and then again, as I said, in, in the school setting, when um, there is the possibility that a child may be eligible for academic accommodations, then that evaluation can be conducted in that setting. Questions? There was a question, um, Dr. Varablo, about whether somebody who is an LPC or an LCSW or L, you know, um, LMFT, if any of those folks are able to diagnose ADHD. My understanding is that um, in order to do the kind of testing that we're talking about, that needs to be a psychologist who who does that kind of testing. Is that right? Um, that said, the the same um, criteria that a medical doctor, healthcare provider could use could also be used by um, a non-psychologist mental health provider. So it doesn't have to be necessarily a doctor. It could be a social worker or some of these other um, kinds of professionals, but the means that they would use to come to the conclusion would be um, profession specific. If that makes sense. Okay. And somebody else asked, what's the combination of features needed to diagnose ADHD? And uh, you know, I'm wondering if if that's just a question about like how many of the symptoms right. that you put up on the slides, I'm not sure. So typically um, in order to be diagnosed with say an inattentive type is inattentive presentation of ADHD, somebody would need to demonstrate six out of nine of the inattentive types of symptoms to be diagnosed with the hyper, hyperactive impulsive, they would need six out of nine of the hyperactive impulsive symptoms. And for the combination, they would need six out of nine of one and six out of nine of the other. And that's a little bit um, age dependent. And again, there are some other sort of qualifiers, but as a general rule, you really need to have a lot of both to get the combination. Great questions. Okay. All right. So let's talk about treatment. Um, there are so, so, so many different kinds of treatments that people talk about um, and have talked about over the decades. Um, many years ago, several years ago, there was a large multimodal study, multi-center study that was conducted um, several hundred participants, and it was called the MTA, the Multimodal Treatment of Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder Study. And this was um, funded by NIMH. So this is not sort of a, um, a big pharma funded, you know, um, kind of a biased um, research. This is the real deal. And it really has been held up ever since as, as really the gold standard. And it looked at a lot of different components of ADHD and treatment of ADHD and um, different kinds of treatment and different, even within one kind of treatment provided by different kinds of people with different kinds of credentials and so forth. It was huge. Of the many, many conclusions that were drawn, one of the big takeaways was that there are essentially three things that work to treat ADHD when we're talking about large populations of people. 
medication, behavior modification training, and I have bolded for parents, we'll talk about that in a moment, and the combination of both of the above, okay? The combination has was shown to work best of all. Second best was medication alone. Third best was behavior modification alone. Okay, so what what is behavior modification? Let's just start right there. Because a lot of people are under the misconception that behavior modification means sending your child to a therapist. And so the therapist can kind of teach the child how to be different or can, you know, can kind of fix the fix, you know, fix, fix my child, right? Fix my child's behavior. And it really is not that. Behavior modification training is done with the parents of the child who has behavior symptoms in order to teach the parents how to elicit different behaviors from their child, okay? And that's a really important distinction that I think is not talked about nearly enough. Um, so when you think about what works, essentially we're talking about medication for the child and training for the parents to help them guide and support their child so that they can behave the best that they possibly can. Okay, and again, the combination of both is really the best that we can do. Um, on that note, I just wanna mention also that there have been lots of other studies over the decades that have shown that other things work sometimes, right? And there are certainly other things that have been shown to as I say, sort of add some points. So if we're looking for a hundred points of improvement in somebody's symptom control, if we're if we talk about if we use the combination of medication and behavior modification training, you know, I say we can get sort of an 85%, we can get a solid B from a zero. And that's not bad. That's life-changing, not only for the child, but for the whole family. There are other things that can add some points here and there, and I don't want to um, diminish the benefits that come from what we call green time, which is time outside in nature, right? Good sleep, getting plenty of good quality sleep at night, healthy diet, um, you know, um, for some people staying away from the dyes and artificial you know, um, ingredients in, in foods, exercise, all these things can certainly add points. But when we're talking about, oh, and, and among those is actually medication for the parents so that they are more available to participate in the behavior modification training and apply the behavior modification training. So there are lots of things that are beneficial when it comes to treating ADHD, but the big three are these three, and these are the ones that we're gonna focus on tonight, okay? When we talk about medications, we're talking about two broad categories. There are stimulant medications and there are non-stimulant medications. And we'll go through these a little bit without trying to get too far into the weeds. So this is a chart that I made up years ago that just kind of breaks down all of ADHD medications. And as we said, there are kind of two broad categories, stimulants and non-stimulants. The stimulants are primarily going to be having their impact on dopamine. The non-stimulants are primarily impacting other neurotransmitters, sometimes in addition to dopamine, but these are primarily looking at other neurotransmitters. Stimulants are mostly impacting the dopamine. And then this is pretty simple, guys. Like from in, within the stimulant category, again, two broad categories. We have methylphenidate derivatives and we have amphetamine derivatives. The methylphenidate derivatives, methylphenidate is the, is the sort of generic chemical name for Ritalin. And so there are many different derivatives of methylphenidate that are in this category. Some are long acting extended release and some are short acting immediate release. Can you see my cursor here? That, okay, so long acting extended release or short acting immediate release. 
within the amphetamine derivatives. And these are things like Adderall and others. Again, we have long acting extended release and we have short acting immediate release. Okay. And then we have non stimulants. Again, two broad categories. We have the SNRI category. Until very recently, there was only one medication in this category, and that was um, Stratera, otherwise known as Atomoxetine. There's now an additional, additional one called Kelbri, which came out, I think, within the last year. And then there are alpha agonists. There are two of these, um, and they are guanfacine and clonidine, which also have trade names. Again, we don't need to get too into the details of this, um, but I did want to make you aware that it's it, there are many, many different medications to treat ADHD. And I know y'all aren't going to be able to see this very well, but I just, to demonstrate, I just want to say that everything, every medication on this chart is specifically to treat ADHD. We have lots and lots and lots of options, but they all boil down to this graph. Okay. So how do we choose which medication we're going to use and what are the risks and benefits of each kind? Um, I gave you here a link to uh, an article about the MTA, not the actual study itself, because that's hundreds of pages, but I gave you this. Um, another one of the findings that was a that was a big um, deal when the MTA was first completed is that careful monitoring makes an enormous difference to the outcome, okay? They compared sort of um, what is typically done in terms of medication management, they compared what's typically done in the community to what's typically done by what I term the gurus in the academic settings where the, the people are ADHD researchers and people who live, sleep and breathe ADHD all the time. And what they found was that the kids who were treated with the same medications by the gurus, as opposed to sort of Dr. Whomever who's in the community treating ADHD among many other things, one of the differences was that the gurus monitored the side effects and the benefits much more um, sort of intensely than the community docs. So these people were getting weekly visits until they had the dose and exact medication and the exact dose and the timing and everything really all figured out. And then they had monthly meetings with the psychiatrist guru thereafter. And the guru spent time with the parents and spent time with the child, monitored the side effects and the benefits extremely careful, carefully, tended to give higher, significantly higher doses of medications than the community docs, but managed the side effects so much more carefully that we ended up seeing that the kids who were treated by the gurus had better compliance with their treatment plan. They had fewer side effects and they had much higher benefit. So the higher doses are not necessarily a bad thing. Higher dose with higher doses does, do not necessarily come more side effects. It's just that it takes someone who really knows what they're doing, who's really paying attention and we can use higher doses so that we get more benefit and less side effect. Okay. So keep that in mind just as a general rule um, or a rule of thumb. That said, there certainly can be side effects um, as with any medication. The stimulants, and this is true for the uh, methylphenidate derivatives as well as the amphetamine derivatives, the ones that we tend to sort of hear about the most are difficulty with sleep initiation, appetite suppression. The appetite suppression tends to be the worst sort of in the middle of the day, which is when the medication is tends to be at its peak, which is lunchtime. Um, moodiness, headaches and stomach aches, and certainly there are others. Um, and when, if you um, 
you know, go to the pharmacy and pick up one of these medications for your child. I certainly encourage you to open up the little um, leaflet thing that comes with the medication and read the whole long list of potential side effects. It's as long as my arm for these medications and for any other. But these are the ones that we tend to see most if we're going to see any. For the non-stimulants, they're a little bit different. We tend to see fatigue, maybe low blood pressure, some stomach aches. Again, there are several other things that could potentially happen and mood issues. And I do wanna spend just a minute on mood issues as they pertain to the SNRIs, which is one of the two categories of non-stimulants, okay? All right, um, all of the SNRIs, as well as all the SSRIs. So these are medications that are typically used to treat depression and anxiety. They all come with an FDA black box label. And this has been controversial from the very beginning. Um, it started in the UK in 2003 and continued then in the US in 2004. There were some controversial evidence that these medications were associated with an increased risk of suicidal ideation in individuals who were 24 years old and younger. And so everybody got sort of up in arms about this and doctors got really nervous, parents got really nervous. And by about 2005, the number of prescriptions that were being written for people 24 and under for their depression and anxiety. At this point, the SNRIs weren't used for ADHD, um, but the number of prescriptions that were written for um, people in this age group declined rapidly. And the number of diagnoses that were made for people in this age group declined rapidly. And what we ended up seeing was kind of a rebound increase in actual suicidality and mortality. So when people were more conservative about diagnosing depression and anxiety and more conservative about the medications that they chose to treat with, we ended up actually seeing more suicides. That has thankfully evened out now over more time, but it's something to keep in mind. And I bring it up just because, as we said, one of the categories of medications that is used to treat ADHD at this point um, is SNRIs, and this is still something to just keep in mind. Okay, I'm going to pause there for a minute. Any questions on sort of the basics of medication categories, side effects, and so on? There were some questions, um, Dr. Farblo. One of the questions was about age, um, like at what age? would it be recommended to start a kid on medication and is like four years old too young? And I think the specific question was, what is the research on the um, effectiveness of medication for kids younger than age six? Because there was a mom whose psychologist recommended that um, she put her four-year-old on men's and she was wondering about the long-term impact of that. Great questions. Um, and and there sounds like there are some different components of that question. So um, I'll start off first. Um, as we said, sort of officially at this point, um, per the American Academy of Pediatrics, the youngest that a person can be diagnosed officially is four years old. Although we certainly see younger kids sometimes who were pretty sure meet, will meet the criteria once they're four. Um, Medication is not recommended under the age of four, but it is recommended now from age four and up as, as needed. Here's the thing about long-term impact. And I just can't, I can't stress this enough. All of the data, all of the data that we have indicate that earlier treatment and more robust treatment 
lead to better outcomes in every category. So when we, when we, again, as a general rule, right, of course, there are always, there's always the possibility of, of bad things happening to good people, right? But as a rule, statistically speaking, the outcomes tend to be much, much better when kids are treated well and treated early. The outcomes we're talking about could include things like um, school suspensions, school expulsions, graduation rates, grades, um, moving on to college, whether or not they are, they're college bound, whether or not they graduate from college, what um, income they have once they are out of college or once they're in the workforce. Other things, trips to the emergency room, unintended pregnancies, substance abuse, car accidents, family problems, like every outcome that you can think of is better when people are treated well and treated early than if treatment is delayed or not sort of robust enough. And that, it, it, it is also true that when you compare people with ADHD to people without ADHD, all of those outcomes tend to be worse in those of us with ADHD than in people without ADHD, right? This is not a panacea and that's true with or without treatment. But when you compare people who have ADHD, if you take that as a given, because people are, you know, it's there or it's not there. There's nothing we can do about that. Once we know it's there and we have the choice of treating or not treating, treating early and treating well is essentially, from a statistical standpoint, always better. Okay, um, and I just, I just can't state that enough, but it's a really important question. Were there other elements to that question that I have forgotten? Um, no, but there was another question about, um, from a, uh, a parent of a 12 year old asking, are there specific behavior modification um, programs or treatment approaches for middle schoolers? So again, the, the behavior modification is for the parents, not for the student or the child, even in middle school and even in high school. Um, the way that it is typically approached is, you know, the parents would come and meet with a professional and certain behaviors would be targeted. So for example, parents or caregivers might come to a professional and say, the biggest problem that I have with my kid right now is that every time I try to get them off the screen to go to bed at bedtime, we try to have them turn off their screens and go to bed. It is always a nightmare. Okay, well then let's break that down and let's look at how does that process typically go in your household? And where can we tweak that process? What can the parents do differently so that they get a different response from, the, from their middle schooler or other age child so that we can end up with a, with a better and more smooth process of going to bed? And once that scenario has kind of resolved and things are better, what do you know? The next thing now pops up to be the highest priority, right? Because that top item has been taken off the list. We're done with that. Awesome. It's great. But ah, now I've got this other thing that is really driving me crazy. Okay. Let's talk about it. Tell me how it goes in your household. Let's talk about how we could do things a little differently. I'll make some suggestions. You'll go home and try it for a couple of weeks. Then you'll come back. If it worked, awesome. We're done with that specific sort of line item. If it didn't work so well, that's fine. We'll make some other tweaks. We'll talk about what, did, what worked and what didn't work and why it didn't work and what happened. We'll tweak. You'll go home and try it again for another week or two, come back. And then once that's resolved, awesome. We're done with that. Oh, what do you know? The next one has popped up to be the top priority. And it goes like that until until the parents have really learned the process well enough to be their own professional 
in that process. Um, and they sort of learn what questions to ask themselves, what elements of the interactions to analyze um, and sort of think twice about, and eventually they can go through this process for themselves and by themselves without the, the need for the professional. Mm -hmm. um, so what it is in, you know, for the parents who live in, you know, the household with one middle schooler and the parents of another middle schooler and another middle schooler, and like, it's different in every single household. So I would um, not even like to venture a guess as to what would be a typical sort of a program for the parents of a middle schooler. I think there was just one other quick, quick question before uh, you move on, and that was somebody asked if an SSRI is beneficial in treatment of ADHD all by itself. SSRIs are not typically used to treat ADHD, um, even in conjunction with other things. They may treat anxiety or depression that coexist with ADHD and may even, well, yeah, but they are not used in the treatment of ADHD. And there are only the two SNRIs even that are used to treat ADHD, and those are Stratera and Calbri. The others that are um, used to treat anxiety and depression are not used to treat ADHD. So great, I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to clarify that. Okay. Um, so, Let's assume that we have received a diagnosis for our child and we have been educated about medication options. And now we want to talk to somebody about maybe getting a prescription for our child. To whom should we talk? And again, there are sort of three broad categories of people that can write prescriptions and manage the medication for children with ADHD. The first are the primary care providers. And again, typically we're talking about pediatricians and family practitioners here, not so much um, internal medicine, um, but the primary care providers who do work ex um, specifically with children. And then there are psychiatrists, and again, there are, there's a difference between psychiat general psychiatrists and psychiatrists who are also boarded to, and um, qualified to work with children and adolescents. So in this case, you're more likely to get, even if you are an adult, you're more likely to get help from a psychiatrist who is trained to treat children and adolescents because they're the ones who've had the most experience treating ADHD. And then I have this sort of vague other category because it's where I put myself frankly, and there are a few of us, although not many. Um, I was originally a primary care provider. I did general pediatrics for about 10 years before I changed my practice entirely and now work exclusively with kids with ADHD and their families. Um, and so I kind of don't fit really either category um, and just consider myself an ADHD specialist. And there are other people out there like me. So I didn't want to leave us out. Um, let's see, what else would I want to say about that? I guess that's um, typically what I recommend is, you know, if if there's every chance that a primary, a good care, primary care provider can do an excellent job treating ADHD. It happens all the time, and there's no reason to think that it wouldn't work. However, it doesn't always work because these folks don't always have the time and or the expertise to get into some of the nuances of the treatment. And in that case, a psychiatrist or another, another would be sort of the next place to go. There's no reason, I'm not saying that you can't start with a psychiatrist or another specialist, um, but if you can't find somebody in these categories, there's no reason to think that starting with a primary care provider would be a bad idea. 
So this is um, typically where people start. And if it works out, great, everybody wins. And you know, you pay your $30 copay and you see the provider who's right down around the corner from you or wherever, you know, the most, this is tends to be a very convenient option. These options, sorry, you're not seeing my cursor probably. These options tend to be maybe less convenient and maybe more expensive, but also maybe, again, as a generalization, um, more specialized. Okay. And that's really the bulk of my presentation. And I wanted to leave the rest of the time for questions and discussion. I want to um, caution that I do not want to get into anybody's specific questions about their specific child or their specific situation. Um, but shy of that, I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, all kinds of questions or make any clarifying remarks. There was a question. Um, there are just a few questions that we haven't addressed so far, but one of them um, was the question of whether ADHD can actually diminish over time. That's a great question. I love this question. We used to think that ADHD was a childhood disorder and that people outgrew it by the time they were adults. We now think that that is much less likely to be the case. I think there are, it, there's some evidence that there are some people who do sort of legitimately outgrow their ADHD, but in most cases, here's what I think happens. You know, as we talked about at the very beginning, when we're talking about ADHD, we're talking about preferred versus non-preferred activities. So let's just imagine that you are a seven-year-old child and math is one of your non-preferred activities. I have bad news for you, kiddo. You have a lot of years of math in front of you, five days a week, maybe more for many years. And there really is nothing that you can do about that fact. You're stuck. If you are an adult and math is your non-preferred activity, I got really good news for you. You have lots of options. You can hire an accountant. You can put everything on auto pay and never have to actually do much math. You can marry somebody who loves doing math. There are lots of things that you can do. You can get a job that involves zero math, right? There are lots of workarounds and there are lots of ways to avoid that non-preferred activity. So to the extent that adults can engineer their lives to avoid their non-preferred activities, and spend most of their time, energy, resources doing what they love to do, they're not likely to show many or any symptoms. The one caveat that I would argue um, with that is that it, it tends to be pretty difficult to outsource relationship management. <laughs> um, and there are always elements of relationships that are non-preferred, right? Let's just be real here for a minute. So. So I, I, you know, I say when you're an adult, you can essentially do away with all the non-preferred activities and focus only on the preferred activities. But in the real world, if you want to have a relationship, I caution you to to keep that in mind. Um, that said, <laughs> right? that said, um, it may look like people outgrow their ADHD when in reality they've probably learned some coping strategies. And mostly they've probably been able to re-engineer their lives so that they just avoid the things that lead to symptoms. And to the extent that even as an adult, you can't avoid those things, you have the option to continue treatment, which many people take and many people don't. So I guess sort of related was um, a question asking you to speak to transitions from high school to adulthood, to college, to a job, to career, and how to navigate medical management during those transitions. Okay, so this is a big topic. Um, one thing that I wanna say is that when it comes to um, 
social, emotional, cognitive development. People with ADHD tend to be three to five years delayed behind their same age peers who don't have ADHD in some of those categories. And so we may be advanced in some very specific ways, but as a rule, we're also delayed in some pretty um, clear departments of, of life. And so when we're talking about transitioning from middle school to high school, high school to college, college into the workforce or whatever, it's helpful to remember that while chronologically you may be ready to make that transition, developmentally, you may not be. And setting that expectation is really important. You know, a very wise person once pointed out to me that disappointment, anger, frustration, these kinds of emotions, really boil down to a mismatch between expectations and, and I mean, they boil down to unmet expectations, right? If you expect that your child, when they graduate from high school, is going to be ready to be independent in college, despite the fact that they have ADHD, you might be disappointed. If you expect that your child is although they're super bright and academically super capable of doing the work in college, but you also have expectations and understanding that in other aspects of their development, they, not be, they may not be ready to be independent, you might have much less frustration, anger, and disappointment. Um, so, so that gets into a whole field, which is um, termed um, asynchronous development. And that has to do with, <clears throat> it's, it's, this is a term that comes from the, the um, literature on gifted students and gifted children, but it has to do with children whose development is out of sync with their chronological peers and children whose development is the different elements of their development are out of sync with each other within the one child. Um, and so if you wanted to do some more homework, um, asynchronous development would be the term to look into there. Okay, so that's one aspect of, of these transitions is being cognizant of where your child is. So if you're talking about an 18 year old who's graduating from high school, in some aspects of their development, they're actually closer to 22 or 23. And in other aspects of their development, they're actually closer to 13 or 14. And I don't know about you all, but I wouldn't send my 13 year old to college, right? No matter how smart they were, and no matter how capable they were of doing, of you know, being successful academically. So things to keep in mind. Um, the other thing about this that I'm wondering if the, the person who asked this question is thinking about is continuity of care with a provider who's writing these prescriptions um, and, and managing the, the treatment and that varies depending on if the person is leaving you know a given state and going across state lines um, and again it also has to do with how how mismatched the demands are to the to the students abilities and, and development. Um, so again, if somebody is going to college and they have always been interested in art and they've all, you know, their whole, all the way through elementary school, middle school, high school, all they've wanted to do is study art and be an artist. And they, you know, all the other stuff has just been maddening to them and frustrating and difficult and whatever. And now they get to go to art school. You may find that the treatment needs actually go down because they are now in a setting that speaks to their strengths and we, they might not need so much support. If you find that the child is someone who has sort of struggled with the academics consistently throughout school and is now going to a school that continues, that is gonna to continue to stretch them academically, 
you might find that their treatment needs actually increase because the demands increase. So the dosage that it takes to get somebody to perform well at the high school level may simply not be adequate to get that same person to perform at the college level and so forth. Um, so, so there are lots of different components to, to considering these transitions. Um, those are just a couple of the topics that come to mind. So speaking of transitions to like adulthood, obviously um, behavior modification for parents when their kids have moved out of the home isn't really appropriate. Um, so what are the options for those young adults? Right. Um, we tend to lean much more heavily on the medication at that point. Um, and we look at pairing the student with an, or the adult with an appropriate structured scenario. So um, here's the problem with, here's the problem with thinking about behavior modification within one individual with ADHD. You know, I have ADHD and there are lots and lots and lots of things that I know I should do and things that I know would make my life easier and that would make me more productive and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, would make me a better everything. And yet before my medicine is kicked in in the morning, and after my medicine has worn off at the end of the day, I can't access those strategies the same way I can when my medicine is on board. And you know how and why that is the case is a whole other lecture that I'm happy to do at some other time. Um, but suffice it to say that we can teach kids and adults strategies until the cows come home but if they aren't able to access those strategies when they need them and use them as appropriate, teaching them those strategies is spitting in the wind. So we have to find what's gonna work for any one individual. And that's where we start looking at some of those other kinds of treatment approaches that I mentioned will give you points along the way, right? So for a lot of people having regular sort of endurance exercise really makes all the difference and makes them much more capable of accessing the strategies that they've been taught maybe since they were seven um, in, in adulthood, right? When their parents aren't there to sort of help structure that for them. Um, for other people, it's, it's, you know, getting plenty of sleep, which is not a small thing for people with ADHD. Sleep disorders are really common in people with ADHD. So figuring that piece out can make a big difference in terms of how you access the strategies and the things that you know that are common sense. You know, I have known all of, since I, since I was driving a car, I've known that if I always put the keys in the same place when I come into the house, I will always find the keys again. And the day, this is a true story. I can't believe I'm going to admit this to all of these people all at once. But the day that I had to borrow the neighbor's car to drive my children to school because I had lost not one, not two, but actually three sets of keys to the same car. I, I, it was like, I, something's got to give here. Like, right. It's not that I didn't know that if I always put my keys in the same place when I walked in the door. I would always be able to find them. I, I knew that, but when I walked in the door, that wasn't where my head was. And so I never did until I made some changes. Um, so just as an example, um, and getting the regular exercise, getting the sleep, the healthy diet, the green time, less screen time, all of these other things, structure, routine, schedule, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, can all make a huge difference. And that's where working with an individual or working with a professional to sort of help figure out which strategies are actually doable for you as a young adult or a 
or a middle-aged adult or an older adult, right? Um, sort of customizing strategies that you can actually access is really the ticket. Um, somebody asked, and, and this may, uh, I'm guessing that just people will have this question. They'll be like, well, who do I look for? Who's the professional that I look for for a young adult? And also there was a question a little bit earlier um, in the chat about um, where to find parent training when you have younger kids, because that particular individual has had a lot of um, many care providers involved in prescribing meds and recommending meds, but nobody, she said, had um, suggested parent training or given her any ideas about where to get that. So where do people access these professionals and what are those professionals called? Right. Okay. So um, I honestly don't, know if Chad is still doing this. For um, Several years ago, long before COVID, Chad was training professionals to, to do behavior modification training for parents. Oh. And I don't know if that's continued. Um, I am not aware of that. Pam, okay. are you aware so, of that? Or Irene, someone could speak up if they think about that there's something, some resource like that, but I'm not aware. Um, okay, so that probably fell away. Um, the, the people, so, and this is what I was saying, like even the pediatricians, even the, the, even the providers who are seeing individuals with ADHD and the families of individuals with ADHD often don't understand what behavior modification means. And they're referring the children for behavior modification therapy as if that's a thing that's ever gonna work. Um, so I'm not surprised that that it's been difficult to sort of access this, this whole um, side of things. I would look for, who would I look for? I would, I would look for um, behaviorists. So um, there are some great behaviorists in this area. area. Dr. Terry Bullis happens to be a behaviorist um, who does this kind of work. And there are others. Um, I don't know, Terry, help me. Um, I guess if I were to try to find somebody, I'd look for parent training. I'd look for behavior modification. I would just go in the Google and I'd say behavior modification yeah. near me or helping yeah. my kid with ADHD, uh, but filtering out those therapists um, who really focus on the behavioral support and mention that in the, on their website or in their work, as opposed to you know, what can be very helpful for other disorders like, you know, play therapy or individual talk therapy and those sorts of things, but aren't necessarily, not what is recommended in this case that we're talking about for ADHD. Yeah, and I think um, you make it a great, um, like parent trainings, right? Parent education classes, parenting classes. That's where I started um, when my kids were little before I even had any inkling about this field at all, I started taking parenting classes. And that, that was really my entry into this whole um, aspect of, of ADHD treatment. So that, yeah, that would be where I would start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and for young adults uh, specifically, I wonder if coaches might be a source you know, looking for an ADHD coach, that might be a good place um, or executive function coaches the, because that's a big term that's out there. Those might yeah. be, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and CBT could be another mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm, possible way to, to get at that. Um, and then just in general, I would say that Chad is, is an incredible resource in and of itself in as a as a resource to get you to other resources right um so absolutely um check in with the chad uh website and sort of scour through that because it's um this is really the clearinghouse of of all things adhd um so use that resource as well so switching tax a little bit, um, so there are some questions around uh, the medication. Like mm -hmm. one question was, I'm just going to throw two questions at you. Okay. <laughs> we'll see if, what, what questions we've missed. One of the questions was, how do you choose which meds to prescribe? 
And then another question is, once your child is on medication, what are the things you should look out for? What are the questions you should be asking your child? What should you be noticing in your child in order to assess, you know, side effects or if it's working or, or whatever? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with the, with the first one, which meds, um, and I'll just throw some, a little bit of statistical garbledygook at you here real quickly when we're talking. So I always start with the stimulants. Stimulants have been used and, and they are first line treatment, not just for me in the field, first line treatment are stimulants. And the reasons are many. One reason is that stimulants have been used in these children since 1937. We have many, many decades of safety and efficacy data showing that stimulants work to help these kids. Um, and I take a great deal of comfort from that right there, right? That's a lot of people <laughs> over a lot of decades. Um, so over 80 years, right? So people have, you know, 80 years ago, people were taking stimulants and have since grown up to be 88, 90 plus year old individuals. And we've been able to see their trajectories. Um, the other thing is that stimulants work better than any other psychiatric medication on the planet. We have really incredible efficacy data that show that stimulants are phenomenal treatment for ADHD. Depending on what study you read and how you define success, we're talking about between 75 and 90 plus percent likelihood of a positive outcome benefit from a stimulant medication. And that's phenomenal. I don't even know if, you know, ibuprofen gives you a 90% chance of pain relief. Like I, I don't, maybe it does, but, um, but it, I mean, that, that's a really, really pretty phenomenal statistic right there. So that's almost always the first line. So then we get back, I'm gonna go back to um, my medication slide here. So for starters, most of the time, we're gonna start right, right here with the stimulants, okay? And then the question comes up, well, how about methylphenidate versus amphetamine? Which category of stimulant should I start with? And <clears throat> here's some more statistics for you. About, 25%-ish of individuals do better using methylphenidate derivatives than amphetamine derivatives. Another 25% do better using amphetamine derivatives than they do methylphenidate derivatives. And the other 50% do equally well or poorly regardless of what you give them. The bottom line of that statistical little tidbit is there is zero statistical guidance. <laughs> throw a dart. Okay. So as a general rule, we, you know, doesn't, we don't have a great way of, of anticipating which category of medication is going to do well for which individual. That said, there are certainly some hints um, and things like how old the person is, family history, what's worked well for a given, um, in, you know, given patients, family members in the past. There are other things that we can look at to determine which we would start with. Um, and then we're getting down to, okay, well, long acting extended release or short acting immediate release. I tend to start with long acting extended release, whether it's the methylphenidate derivatives or the amphetamine derivatives. And my process is I wanna find something that covers the symptoms for a student for the bulk of the day like when they're in school. Once I know what medication works for the bulk of the day and how long it works and what dose and so forth, then I can layer in the short acting immediate release medications to help kind of bookend the beginning and or the end of the day to make sure that the patient, the student is, has the symptom coverage that they need to get through their whole day, okay? But, you know, 
between methylphenidate derivatives and amphetamine derivatives, there really isn't a great way to know in advance which category is going to work better for any one individual. Mm -hmm. um, with, with regard to the non-stimulants, the non-stimulants can be used either as what we call monotherapy, you know, any one of these by itself, or in conjunction with a stimulant. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll start with a stimulant and maybe we find something that works fairly well, but not quite well enough. And we think we can do better. Or maybe what we find is that as we increase the dose over time to get to the place where we're, where we're really seeing benefit, one of two things happens. And the, the way I, that I approach treatment as a general rule, I start with the lowest dose they make of whatever medication I decide I'm gonna start with and gradually work my way up over time in dose until one of two things happens. Either we get to the place where, hey, things are great. Symptoms are covered. We're good to go. Awesome, let's hold at that dose over time. Or we bump into side effects, rats. We didn't have side effects at 40 milligrams of XYZ medication, but we also didn't have great benefit. So we tried 50, mm, 50 wasn't tolerable because of the side effects. Let's go back down to 40, wasn't great, but it was better than nothing. And there were no side effects. And now let's layer in a non-stimulant and see if we can get to the place where we have the benefits that we want without the side effects. The non-stimulants are less likely to be effective as monotherapy than the stimulants are. So I, I and traditionally this is kind of how it's, how it, the, the, um, the decision chart, the flow chart goes, we start with the stimulants as first line and then layer these in as needed down the line. Um, and then how to monitor whether or not the medication is working and whether or not it's causing problems. Again, different practitioners have different approaches to this. What I actually really like is for the parents to just notice what they notice and the child, the patient to just notice what they notice. I don't want anybody sort of looking for any specific preconceived change from a medication. I just want to know, you know, try this medication at, at this dose for a couple of weeks and come back and tell me what you saw. And it's my job to then determine whether what you've noticed is likely to be because of the medication or just a coincidence. That's not really your job as the parent. Um, so I, I really like people to come in and just sort of say, you know, I didn't, oftentimes the kids will say, I didn't notice anything because the thing is that these medications typically when they're, when they're working right and we found the right medicines, the kids don't feel anything. This is the kind of thing where we notice in retrospect, oh gosh, you know, in math class, I found myself looking at the clock like every two minutes before I started taking medication and the class seemed like it took forever. I thought math class would never end every day. It was like the longest week of my life. And now that I'm taking X medication at Y dose, I've noticed that I actually don't look at the clock until the last five minutes of class. Huh, you think that has anything to do with the medication doc? <laughs> yes, yes I do. Um, so it can be subtle things like that, but if I, if, if I tell people to look for that, I think it kind of skews the whole process. Mm -hmm. um, likewise with side effects, I tell kids, you know, notice what you notice. And if what you notice is that the, the big toe on your left foot has just been itching like crazy ever since you started taking this medication, tell me about it. And we'll figure out, it's my job to figure out if I think that that's related to the medication or if I think it's coincidence or something else. It's not your job as the child or as the parent to know or determine 
whether that's a side effect of the medication. Um, so, you know, that's sort of a conceptual answer. The more concrete answer would be to go back to these symptoms that we talked about that led to the diagnosis in the first place and see if you notice, again, retrospectively, looking back over the period of time since the child started taking XYZ medicine, do you notice any changes in these kinds of behaviors? Awesome. Um, and then when do we know when we've sort of hit that, um, you know, final sort of yay, we're there moment. Sometimes what we do is feels really, really good, but maybe we can do better. So we try to go up one more notch. Ah, we bump into side effects and we realize, no, you know what? This other dose that was like, let's just hold there. Let's just hold there because actually things are really pretty good. They're not perfect. These medications are not going to make everything perfect. And if they do make things perfect, I think we should back off anyway, right? Because families, kids aren't supposed to be, nobody's supposed to be perfect. Humans aren't supposed to be perfect. So if we're getting perfect, that's a problem, but that's another conversation. Again, um, we tend to know that things are right either because they just intuitively feel really, really good. And, and the, the person, Here's the thing. I define ADHD as being symptomatic when there is a gap between somebody's potential and their performance most of the time. So if you and everybody around you sort of, or some people around you at least, feel like you have the potential to be performing at this level, and mostly we have that sense because every now and then, the stars align just right or something just happens and these kids knock it out of the park. They perform at this level for no apparent reason. We tend to then hold that against them because the next day when they're performing at this level, right? Yesterday, you were ready on time. I know you can do it. It must be that today you're late because you want to be late or because you're just trying to irritate me or blah, 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 right? when in fact, it's just that there was one day when it just happened to come together, but most of the time, the actual performance is here, despite the fact that the potential is here. And when we are, when we really have the treatment right, is when we're like, we're hovering right here. And there's this sense of like, yeah, I am, I'm, this is what it's supposed to be like. This is what I've always, hoped I was capable of. And I, you know, we saw little glimmers here and there that maybe this is what we were capable of. And now it really, we're really hovering right about there. That's when we know we've got it. Yes. Excellent. Well, um, we are running up against time. There is, I think one more question perhaps, and maybe that's a, a shorter answer so we can get, make sure everybody gets to to go when they need to go. The last question that I think we have that we haven't answered is, do we have to let teachers know if we're, if we put our kids on meds? The answer is no, you don't have to do anything. I always advise that the parents do let the schools know that they're, when their kids are on medication for a couple of reasons. One is if there's, God forbid, ever an emergency, the first thing that every ambulance driver and every EMT has been trained to ask everybody is, are they taking any medications? And you want someone in the school to be able to say, yes, they're taking this, this, and this medications, because that's just good medicine. So that's one thing. The other thing is, you know, teachers, we don't typically have eyes on our kids when they are in school. We as parents don't typically have eyes on our kids when they're in school. Teachers have eyes on our kids when our kids are in school. And and to the extent that we can collaborate with the teachers and get feedback from them about what's working, what's not working, what side effects might they be seeing, what changes are they seeing, then that can be incredibly valuable information as we're trying to really fine tune the treatment. Um, so yeah, I usually recommend, and it also frankly gives teachers more, a, a higher likelihood of, of having empathy for your child, right? When we see certain behaviors and we don't have an explanation for them, we make one up. And sometimes the explanation that teachers make up 
not that they're bad humans. I mean, this is sometimes the, the explanations that humans make up to explain other people's behaviors is not <clears throat> a very complimentary explanation. When in fact, <clears throat> if they realize that the true explanation is that the child has ADHD and is doing the best that they possibly can, they're just not getting the right support to be able to do better. Sometimes the teachers have a lot more empathy and kindness that they can and um, consideration that they can extend to the to the child. So good lots, point. Uh, again, a long answer, but <laughs> good point. Good point. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us all tonight. I think everybody got a lot out of this presentation. There may have been unanswered questions, but I'm sure that people can reach out to you Absolutely. Um, if they want to ask those questions. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Terry. Absolutely. I hope everyone has a good evening. Definitely, definitely. And folks, we do have one more lecture next week on Tuesday, the 25th. Um, Dr. Rebecca Resnick, Dr. Christine Rosenthal, and Dr. Rachel Singer will all be joining us, and their talk is entitled, It's Complicated When ADHD Comes with Anxiety, which is uh, those two things tend to co-occur co at a high level of frequency. So that'll be a really interesting lecture. We hope you'll join us. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Have a good evening. <laughs>